This is the Law School Show. Hello everyone, and welcome to the Law School Show. My name is Amos Vang, and I will be your host for this episode. The Supreme Court of Canada, the highest court in the country, the final destination. It is obvious that all decisions coming from the Supreme Court will have very real, long-lasting effects on Canadians. It is also obvious that writing and preparing such decisions are extremely difficult. It is also obvious that to become a justice of the Supreme Court of Canada and to properly perform the tasks associated with such a position, one must have a very specific skill set and experience level. However, What is not obvious are the stories and journeys that justices of the Supreme Court have traveled throughout their lives. What makes them stand out on the judicial stage of history? Well, my guest for today is a person that has stood on that very judicial stage of history. My guest is former Pweeney Justice of the Supreme Court of Canada, the Honorable Marshall Rothstein. Justice Rothstein was born in 1940 in Winnipeg, Manitoba. He attended law school at the University of Manitoba and was called to the Manitoba Bar in 1966. For the next 26 years, Justice Rothstein would present an impressively diverse legal practice in the areas of administrative law, transportation law, labor arbitration, commercial arbitration, and competition law. In 1992, Progressive Conservative Prime Minister Brian Mulroney nominated Justice Rothstein to be appointed to the trial division of the Federal Court of Canada. In 1999, Justice Rothstein was appointed to the Federal Court of Appeal. After 14 years of judicial experience at these federal courts, Justice Rothstein would have perhaps the greatest appointment of his entire career. On March 1st, 2006, Justice Rothstein was appointed to the Supreme Court of Canada. Justice Rothstein would serve as Pweeney Justice of the Supreme Court of Canada for the next nine years, retiring on August 31st, 2015. Since then, Justice Rothstein was called to the Bar of British Columbia, where he continues to practice law at Osler, Hoskin, and Harcourt in Vancouver. To date, Justice Rothstein enjoys over 50 years of legal and judicial experience and has authored over 100 judgments and arbitral decisions. Justice Rothstein is known as an excellent advocate and an even better justice. But here at the Law School Show, we know Justice Rothstein as something else. A legend. Versatile, intelligent, and merciful, Justice Rothstein joins me on the show today. Justice Rothstein, thank you so much for coming on to the show. Thank you for inviting me. So let's start off from the beginning and going all those years back. What inspired you to go to law school? Well, I'll I'll take you back. I guess we all uh, come at uh, our educations and our careers in different ways. Um, uh, My my becoming a lawyer was almost an accident. Uh, and I'll explain the story this way. Uh, I, I had been interested in business uh, and I was in my last year of commerce at the University of Manitoba. And I had been out interviewing for jobs. But at the same time, I ran for the presidency of the University Students Union. And, and lo and behold, I won but I still didn't know what I was going to do. Well, I had been active in politics and I had been active in the model parliament at the university and the executive assistant to the then premier of Manitoba came to see me. And he told me that it was very important to the party that I stay in in school and be president of the student union. So I went to the Dean of Commerce uh, to discuss an honors year in commerce, but after talking to him, I decided that I I wasn't going to to get much value out of that. Um, One of my classmates was going to go into law school and he encouraged me to do the same. And uh, in my last year of commerce, I uh, 
we, we, had, a, we had a class uh, in commercial law. And uh, one of the teachers who later became the dean of the law school's name was Cliff Edwards. And he taught contracts and bills of exchange and some other commercial courses. And uh, I must say that he, he was a wonderful teacher and uh, he made contracts really come to life uh, for me um, and taught, uh, taught us about offer and acceptance and consideration and misrepresentation and uh, impossibility performance and all of the, 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 the nuts and bolts of contract law. And, uh, and I must say that he, he really was a good teacher and, and that was probably a, 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 one of the strongest influences that caused me to uh, go to law school. But you can see that it was just a confluence of circumstances. Uh, I, I didn't have uh, great ideals or, uh, or a grand plan to become a lawyer and certainly not to become a judge of the Supreme Court. Well, that's certainly a very great inspiration as well and an interesting start. But what's also interesting is that way before law school, you actually worked on a dining car on a railway. So describe to us a day in the life of working on a dining car as a pantry man and as a waiter. You are taking me back. Um, I... Uh graduated from uh, high school in 1958. And uh, the country was in a recession at the time and it was very difficult to, to get jobs for, for young kids. Uh, uh, I, 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 I can't remember why, but uh, there, so for some reason, I went down to the CPR uh, office to look for a job and I, I got a job delivering freight bills on my, on my, on my own bicycle. And uh, it was in May uh, and uh, I, I was riding on my bike uh, and the weather was terrible in Winnipeg in, in that year. Uh, it was raining every day and I was riding this bicycle. And after a week, I, um, I, I, I knew this job wasn't for me even though I didn't have any other prospects. And I went to the um, manager of the, the freight bill department and, um, and he <laughs> walked in the office. He said, yeah, I didn't think you'd make it. <laughs> and I said, is, is there anything else? And he said, well, go to the dining car office. And, uh, and, and indeed I went to the dining car office and um, uh, the, <laughs> the manager there, his name was Jimmy McHugh. And he looked at me and he said, you're on number one tonight. And, uh, and, and he said, you need a pair of black pants and a white shirt and, uh, and black shoes, which I, I had. And, um, and I, uh, I went home and that night I went to the Canadian Pacific Railway Station and, and I got on the train. And, um, and uh, in my first year, I was a pantry man, which I'll explain. Uh, and, and after that, in subsequent years, I was a, a waiter. The, in the dining car, if you can kind of envisage a long, a, a long corridor, um, and, and inside the corridor is the kitchen, and near the, near the dining room is what they call the pantry. And uh, I can't remember exactly what the pantry man did. He, we, we, made, we cut the grapefruit and we made the salad and we poured the juice and, and we chopped the ice. In those days, big blocks of ice came on the dining car and we had to chop it uh, in order to go into the glasses and we washed the glasses and, uh, and things like that. So we weren't involved in cooking, but, but that was the job of the, of the pantry man. Um, and, uh, and then, um, uh, in subsequent years, as I told you, I became a waiter and I can tell you that, uh, it was very hard work. Um, uh, when we got on the train at night, we'd spend an hour, an hour and a half preparing for the next morning, went to bed and, uh, got up and had to be in the dining car at six uh, to, 
to get everything organized. And uh, the, the customers, the passengers started coming into seven. And uh, my route was from Winnipeg to Vancouver. And, um, and so there were two time changes during the day. Uh, and so it became a very long day. Uh, and, and, uh, and in those days, um, certainly in the pantry, we were standing up all the time. Uh, but as a waiter, in those days, even if there was only one customer in the dining car, we weren't allowed to sit down. We had to stand up. And, uh, and so we'd start work at six in the morning. We'd finish at about 10 or so at night. But in that period was a, a two hour time change. So it was like finishing at midnight. So we put in 18 hours pretty much except for eating our, our breakfast, lunch, and dinner and having a short break in the afternoon for maybe an hour, uh, we'd be on our feet. And, and it, was, it was a pretty, uh, pretty onerous uh, kind of work. You know, it wasn't outside and it wasn't uh, um, uh, doing dangerous work. But it was hard work. Those people worked hard in, in that job, and uh, and that was the that was the nature of the of the job. Wow, eighteen hours of of very very hard uh, physical work, essentially. I mean, well, that's right. I, I should say now on the way back, we saved the two hours. So, so then the day was a little shorter, except that the break in the afternoon was shorter too. So, uh, but, but it was a long, it was a long day. That's yeah, exactly. Still a very, very intense day. And, uh, you, yeah, definitely. And seeing all these different, all these different people and all these customers on that, uh, on, on that railway. I mean, I can imagine there were a lot of challenges aside from, the, the long hours that you had to face at the time as both a pantry man and as a waiter. And what were the greatest challenges that you had to face during that time? Well, you know, uh, you can imagine if you've ever been on a train that you're working in pretty close quarters with other people. Uh, and the, in the summertime, the crew of a dining car was about maybe 10, maybe 11, even sometimes 12. Uh, employees, and as I say, you're you're working with them in, in, in close quarters, and you have to get along. Um, now, remember that in the late fifties, early sixties, we're only fifteen or so, 14, 15, 16, 17 years out from the end of the for uh, the end of the Second World War. A number of the employees uh, on the dining car, the regular employees, not the students, um, uh, came from Europe. Uh, in, indeed, I know that I, I know some of them had been in the German army. I don't know exactly what they did, uh, and I don't know. Uh, but I, 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 I shouldn't say more because I'd be speculating. I certainly didn't ask them. Um, I'm Jewish. There was uh, there's still remnants of anti-Semitism in those days, and and certainly some of these people coming from Europe uh, had their views. And, you know, occasionally I might hear a comment, um, and, but look, I needed the job and I had to get along, and uh, and uh, I, I I did, and in fact I got to know these people. Uh, uh, fairly well. I mean, you're bound to if you're on the same crew all summer uh, and, and you get to know them and, and indeed you get to like them. Um, and, 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 and after I became a lawyer, some of them became my clients. So, uh, so you know, you did, uh, you, did, you did learn to get along, but, but you were dealing with people from very different backgrounds. These were not people who had gone to university. These were people who had, many of them had been soldiers, uh, uh, not fighting for our side. And, um, and uh, so you, you 
you, you, you learned a lot about, uh, about human nature and about dealing with people, uh, dealing with, with people whose uh, uh, objectives in life and, uh, and their opportunities in life would be different than, than, than mine. And, uh, and uh, you, you, learned, you learned to, to deal with that. And you learned that these people worked very hard and uh, and that their 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 jobs that, that was their life. So uh, so you came to you came to I came to respect these people greatly uh, because of the fact that they worked hard. They were dedicated. Uh, they 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 were dedicated to the success of of, of their work and the dining car and uh, and that was uh, that was instructive to me. Wow, that is very, very interesting and a very, very unique dynamic as well. I mean, you mentioning that some of them were on the German army at the time. Wow. I mean, I, I guess I can't even imagine. I, I can't even imagine, you know, that, that first, your first interactions with them and you knowing who, who, which side they were on. I mean, of course, it was 15 or so years out from the war, but I, I can't imagine how, I mean, I guess maybe it would have felt like kind of uncomfortable at first. And then, but then afterwards, like you mentioned, you, you afterwards, you started respecting them a lot more because they were very hardworking, but that is very, very interesting. Like I, being able to get along with people who essentially had very, very terrible views about who you are and, you know, where you belong. It, it's that is a very, very interesting dynamic. I, I don't want to make more of it than it is. You know, um, uh, we were all working together and, and getting our job done and, and trying to do it properly and not getting on the wrong side of the dining car steward, who was the boss, he was the king of the dining car. Uh, that, was our, that was our main function. So, uh, so I, I don't want to make more of, of these differences that I, that I mentioned, but they were there and, uh, and uh, they were part of, the, part of the environment there. Right. And along with this, there were some very important lessons that you learned from your time working in the dining car on the CPR. And what were the most important lessons that you learned from that time? Well, I learned, uh, perhaps the most important thing is that I learned that there are a lot of people in, in the world, and certainly in Canada, who work very, very hard. Uh, and uh, they don't have desk jobs like lawyers. Uh, they work hard. Their incomes are not what lawyers' incomes uh, are. And uh, you know these are people who are who, who are, are are working hard and are scraping together to 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 keep their their homes and their kids and their families together. Uh, and um, and when you when you see that and you see how hard they work, uh, it gives you a lot of respect for these people, and it uh, makes you realize that. Uh, uh, having a university education, whether you're a lawyer or some other job, uh, is a great privilege. And, uh, and uh, you're not, you're not, work you're, you're working hard, obviously, but it's a different kind of hard work than the, than the work that, uh, that these people are doing. I say these people, and I say these people, I'm talking about dining car waiters, but I'm talking about all people who do physical kind of work. Um, and, and there are a lot of them in, in the country, and, uh, and uh, they're to be respected. Yes, absolutely. I, I, this is something that I, it's very refreshing to hear this because even nowadays, sometimes when I talk with maybe it, whether if it's friends or colleagues or people that I've just known and, you know, they, they talk about so-and-so doing a specific kind of job. That's not an office job. That's not a doctor or lawyer, engineer or whatever. I often see and hear their comments or their reactions. 
And their reactions are like, oh, he's doing that job or he's doing this job or she's doing that job or this job. And they look at it and they kind of look at it in a way that is very, very negative or even der derogatory even. And my reaction has always been everyone has a role to play in not just society, but in their communities, but even with their jobs as well. And pretty much everyone, their jobs are important at some level and they're important for helping society, society run. So it's this level of respect that I don't usually see a lot from, from some, some people, unfortunately, from, from people who just look at it, oh, it's not a doctor or a lawyer or engineer. Oh, that person's good. Uh. I, I don't get why there's that prevailing notion amongst a lot of people. But yeah, it's it, like you said, it's so important to recognize that everyone's working hard and everyone, in addition to that, has something to contribute to the table, so to speak, in in Canadian society. It's just a matter of the different, it, it's a different way of providing that kind of service or that kind of responsibility or that kind of contribution to Canadian society in general. And I think I think more people need to be reminded of that or at least remember that in their daily lives whenever they're dealing with different people. Well, I agree with you because we all rely on that. You know, when you go to a restaurant, uh, uh, there's a waiter there who is working very hard on his or her feet. Uh, and um, and uh, when, you, when you get on a, on a bus, uh, there's a driver there that's, that's got a, a job. Uh, and I, I could... I, 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 and there are people uh, working for the, 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 the hydro businesses and uh, uh, on... On, on, on poles and stringing wires and doing things like that. I mean, these are hard jobs and, and some of them are dangerous jobs, construction workers. Uh, uh, we, we rely on them. All, all Canadians rely on them and, uh, and they, they deserve to be respected. Absolutely. Absolutely. And still on the topic of, of, of waiters and waitresses, I mean, like nowadays I hear about stories of waiters wait especially waitresses having to to worry about you know like you know unwanted advances or harassment and stuff like that nowadays and you know or bad customers or customers that are just being so rude to them i mean again like waiters like, like waiters waiters and waitresses like uh, from pretty much anywhere in canada have had to deal with this to varying degrees of regularity and i'm sitting here thinking why are people giving servers such a rough time doing their jobs when they're just doing their jobs number one number two you know it's it's just it's just like it, just treating another human being as a human being or as someone that is a, like an equal person I, I that's something that i've always been really confused about with with how people how some customers treat other servers or service or, or service job workers it's a little bothersome to to see that, and I, like we've been discussing so far, it it all comes down to whether that uh, the dining car was all male. There were yeah. no women on the dining car in those days, and uh, and so the issue of of, of, of advances or harassment of, of that nature wasn't there. Uh, although there is, I'm, I'm sure if I thought about it, there were occasions of harassment among the among the male uh, waiters and uh, yeah. people in the dining car, but not very often. As I told you, you're working at close quarters and you have to get along, and so it was pretty rare uh, for that to uh, to arise. But but I do agree with you that uh, even that, that today. Uh, there are occasions of people uh, 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 doing things that they shouldn't be doing with respect to the waiters, waitresses, and, and other people who are who are there doing their job and uh, and uh, and uh, doing things that we all need. Absolutely, yeah, definitely. And after your time working in the dining car, you would go to law school and. You went to law school in somewhere around the 1960s. 
What were the greatest hurdles that you had to overcome when you transitioned from university to law school? Um, well, let me describe what, what law school was like in those days. It was quite different, at least in their tone, it was quite different than, than law school today. Um, the law school was run by the Law Society. Uh, the law school was in law courts building downtown. Law school was a four-year course. For four years, uh, the law students went to law school in the morning and the law courts building, and we articled in the afternoon and all day during the summer, except when we were on the dining car, uh, which, which caused me a little pain uh, over the time, but I'll, I'll come back to that later. Um, Articling in those days was for the benefit of those lawyers who used the articling system as cheap labor, often to do menial tasks like searching titles at the land titles office or filing documents at the, at the courthouse. Um, and, so, uh, and so that was the nature of, uh, of, uh, of law school and articling in those days. And that stayed that way until about three years after I graduated. And then the Manitoba system changed to what, what is more uh, like the system today. Uh, law school became a three-year course at the university. It was run by the university, not by the, the law society. And, um, and uh, article was one year after law school, which is typical. Uh, experience uh, today. Um, uh, but in those days, uh, well, to begin with, I had to, I had to uh, get a job as, a, as an article student. And so I, uh, I, I didn't know any lawyers. I had no lawyers in my family. I got my, my, my family didn't use lawyers. Uh, uh, and so I had no connections. Um, but I told you that it was the premier's executive assistant who told me I had to stay in school, stay at the university to become president of the students' union. And uh, so I, I, I don't know whether he offered or whether I asked, but I, I, somehow I found out that I needed to get a job as an articling student. And uh, he said that he would find me an articling job. And he came back and he told me a number of firms that wouldn't take me because I was Jewish. Uh, but he said that there was this firm, Thorvaldson, Eggertson, Saunders, and Morrill. And he said Thorvaldson and Eggertson were Icelandic, and Saunders was Anglo-Saxon, and Morrill was Italian. And then he said that they even had a Greek in there. And he said they would take anyone, and they took me. And, uh, and so it was a challenge to get a job, uh, but I, I was fortunate to get one. And, uh, and uh, then uh, <laughs> my problem was that in those days, they, they paid the articling students very poorly in my first year, $40 a month. Well, even in the 1960s, that wasn't very much money. And I, I, I came from humble roots and I needed to make more money. And uh, so what I would do is that I would go down to the CPR station on Friday night and hop on the train and go to Vancouver and get back on Tuesday morning. And I would tell the other law students in the office uh, to, if anybody asked where Rothstein was on Monday, to say he was at the land titles office searching titles or he was, uh, or he was uh, filing documents in the, in the courthouse. And uh, I, I'm sure they knew what I was doing, uh, but uh, we, we kind of, they, 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 they didn't fire me. And uh, although, although my later experience becoming a lawyer, uh, it came back to me, but I, I'll get into that later. They, uh, they tolerated it and I, I carried on. So it was, uh, it, it, it was a bit of an ordeal uh, in that sense. That is fascinating because they, to me, it seems like your experiences as a pantry man and a waiter on the dining car had already given you that toughness, that ability to balance such overwhelming odds, like discrimination, first of all, that, that's, that's already 
that's already a whole package to deal with. That's the first thing. And then second of all, the pay, like as you mentioned, $40 a month, that is basically nothing. Like you could barely even survive off of that. So you had to work that extra bit of jobs on the weekends in order to to make ends meet. That is wow. <laughs> that 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 takes a lot of toughness and a lot of energy in order to get to get through that. That is that is amazing. Well, you know, uh, I I may be wrong by, by, by in my numbers a little bit, but not much. Uh, I only graduated with about thirty to thirty five people in my class. And I'm sure that uh, part of the reason was that in those days, uh, if you if you couldn't afford to 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 exist on forty dollars a month or in your second year sixty dollars a month, uh, you couldn't afford to be a law student. And uh, you know, I'm not quite sure what other people did in order to supplement their income if they needed to, but uh, I knew what I had to do, and uh, and I did it. And look, um, fear is a great motivator. And, uh, and uh, when you know that you, you, you've, got to, you've got to earn some money and you've got to do your job and, uh, and you've got to carry on, you, you carry on. Yeah, and you certainly did carry on in so many different ways. And after, after completing law school, your practice, as I mentioned in the introduction, would be very diverse. And especially in the area of transportation law, you having firsthand experience on that dining car and on so many different aspects of the railway. Looking back over the last 60 years or so, how has transportation law evolved? Like, How have you seen the practice evolve and how has the laws evolved overall in response to Canada's ever-changing technological progress? Well, um, I'll take you on a bit of a journey, but uh, uh, transportation law, essentially railway law to begin with, but then airline law in, in, was, was fully regulated. And, uh, and so uh, there was a board of railway commissioners and later it was called the board of transport commissioners. And when I came along, it was called the Canadian Transport Commission. Uh, and, uh, and so uh, uh, all freight rates and, and passenger fares and uh, service was all totally regulated. Um, uh, the, the regulator, uh, you had to, the railways and the airlines had to get approval for uh, airfare and, and freight rate increases and uh, it was highly regulated. Uh, it started to become deregulated uh, a little bit, not much, a little bit, just when I was starting practice in the late 1960s. Uh, and then during the 70s, there was greater deregulation in the United States and Canada followed suit in the 1980s. And uh, transportation was never fully deregulated, you know, in, in rail. The reason it was regulated was that um, the railway companies had a lot of market power. If you were a coal mine or a, 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 a grain elevator, or, uh, or uh, a lumber producer, a sawmill, and you needed rail, chances are you'd only have access to one railway company. Well, they, there had to be some way to, to control the rates and the service. Otherwise, uh, you, 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 you could be disadvantaged. But what they, what they began to realize in the 1970s, 1980s was that uh, that uh, competition, even, even in the cases of uh, what, what you might call captive shippers uh, to one railway, there was still room for competition. I mean, trucks were becoming more pervasive and, um, and uh, there were other reasons to think that, that there could be competitive uh, efforts. And uh, as a result, uh, transportation was much more deregulated, not totally, because as I said, uh, there, there was still an element of market power to the railway companies. And, uh, and so there were still ways in which shippers 
could um, could could achieve free grades or service that they needed. There was still a regulation of that nature, but it was largely largely deregulated. So that was that was the big big change uh, that took place in transportation law over the course of sixty years. And and I, I won't bore you with all the details, but it was deregulated in stages. And um, and so the the, the, the the railway legislation and the air legislation would be reviewed every 10 years or so. And, and there were greater attempts to deregulate uh, each each time. Wow, that's, that's, that's very interesting and fascinating. And nowadays we are on the cusp of of new modes of transportation, such as, well, we apparently there's space planes now, the uh, planes that can actually go up to the edge of space or just up at certain parts of the atmosphere that are now blurring the lines between air travel and space travel. I, I can only imagine what transportation law would look like over the next 50 or so years, or even the next 20 years, honestly. And it's not, not even think that far into the future. This is there's going to be a lot of very interesting issues that will come out of that because we're not just talking about, you know, jurisdiction within on earth, but also just reaching just above that a little bit into, you know, space jurisdiction and exactly how does it work up there? That's going to be very interesting to, to see uh, the next, over the next 20 years. But, you know, I guess this is what's something that, that the future is going to have to hold and we're going to have to figure it out as we have these different modes of changes in the future. Well, well, they will, and you know there will be two steps forward and one step backward. But uh, but uh, people will start to to find ways in which these uh, new developments and new technologies can be used, and can be commercialized, and as they become commercialized, uh, we'll have to look at different kinds of laws that uh, that uh, apply to these new modes. Definitely. And returning back to your career and you, after many years of legal practice, you decided, you decided rather to become an adjudicator for the Manitoba Human Rights Tribunal. What inspired that decision? What inspired that shift from, from legal practice into adjudicating? Well, uh, I should explain that this, I, I, I did a few adjudications, but it was a very small part of my, uh, of my practice. Um, uh, I, I can't remember precisely, but I think I was asked if I would adjudicate a, uh, a human rights complaint. Uh, the human rights legislation was quite new in those days in Canada. Uh, the precedents that were used were all American. And, um, and uh, so I, I agreed to, to do it. It was, it was a challenge, it was a new area for me. I didn't know anything about it, uh, but I used to call myself a door lawyer, anything through the door. And so I was asked to do this. And, uh, you know, one of, my, one of my mottos is to always, uh, always take every opportunity that, that arises for you. And, uh, and so I did it. It wasn't very lucrative. Uh, you know, they, they, I was being paid at government rates, and, uh, and, but that was fine. I enjoyed the experience. And it, was, uh, it, it certainly taught me uh, something uh, for, that was useful to me in my own practice. You know, when I, when I uh, became an adjudicator, uh, so I was sitting on the other side of the bench and uh, and the lawyers would make objections, and uh, and uh, they would uh, cross examine interminably, uh, sometimes not very effectively, and um, and it caused me to change my own me method of practice. You know, I had I had often tried to make objections and tried to cross examine when it wasn't necessary. And, and sitting on the other side of the bench taught me that, uh, you know, that wasn't always useful. So it, 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 was a, it was a training experience for me. I didn't know it at the time, but, uh, but as it turns out, it was a training experience for me. Certainly was. And 
I would, I can only imagine that having that extra bit of experience would have made you an even better advocate because, as you mentioned, not every objection or, or rather, objecting that often doesn't help your case very, very much. And being a smarter advocate and a smarter litigator, that would have been something that you benefited greatly from from your time as an adjudicator at, at that time and balancing a practice as as well. I can only imagine that 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 was doing wonders for your legal practice. Well, it, 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 it taught me a lot, I, I have to say. It, it taught me and uh, it, it was valuable in that sense. And as I say, I didn't know that I was going to be uh, the beneficiary of that uh, at the time, but, uh, but as it turns out, I was. And that adjudication experience also helped you a lot in preparing yourself for becoming a judge of the Federal Court of Canada. So describe the moment when Prime Minister Brian Mulroney called you and told you that you were going to be appointed to the Federal Court of Canada. What was that moment like? What were you feeling in that moment? Well, uh, first of all, I have to correct you. I was called by uh, Justice Minister Kim Campbell. She was the Justice Minister at the time. Later, she became Prime Minister, but it, it, I wasn't called by the Prime Minister. I was called by the Justice Minister. Um, I was in the Air Canada office in Montreal. Uh, in 1992, Air Canada was trying to uh, take over what was then called Canadian Airlines. And so it was a big competition case because in those days, uh, if Air Canada had been able to take over Canadian, uh, uh, they would have certainly been had a very, very large market share. And so it was very controversial. And of course, Canadian and American Airlines and, and, and other consumers and other people were opposed. Well, I was in the Air Canada office preparing a witness uh, that day, June 24th, 1992. And I started getting calls from people in Ottawa and, and others saying that I, uh, that I was going to be appointed a judge that day. And so I kept going in and out of this meeting with, the, with this witness. And uh, finally, I was called at four o'clock and I was asked if I would accept a call from the Minister of Justice. And I said, of course, I said I would. And she called me at five and, uh, and she told me that she would appoint me to the Federal Court of Trial Division. And, uh, and, and, I, and I said, fine, I'll accept. And she said, that's fine. As of right now, you're no longer a lawyer. You can't practice law, you're done. And uh, thank you very much, goodbye. Well, I didn't know what I was gonna do. I had this witness in the other room and, uh, and, and, and I didn't know quite who to tell or how to, how to deal with this. Um, but I tried to contact the uh, vice president of law who I was kind of reporting to. And, um, and uh, it was after five and I couldn't reach him. And I knew another vice president who had been a friend of mine, the vice president of marketing, and, um, and I tried to reach him, I couldn't reach him. And finally, there was a witness coordinator in the, where, where I was, there were the three of us, myself, the witness, and this witness coordinator. And uh, finally, I went to the witness coordinator and said, you better send the, uh, the witness home. I'm, I'm not gonna be able to do anything more today. And I try. I think I tried to get these vice presidents a few more times. I couldn't reach them. Finally, I went to the witness coordinator and I said, "Look, here's the problem." I said, uh, "I've just been appointed to judge, and I'm not allowed to practice law anymore." And she said, "Oh," she said, "So that's the problem." She said, "We thought that you had gone over the other side." <laughs> <laughs> And so, anyway, that was the uh, that was the uh, the situation. That was the day that I was uh, appointed. Um, of course, as soon as the word got out, I started getting calls from lawyers in my office in Winnipeg, um, and uh, and there was a hastily called uh, partner partners meeting. I'd been the chairman of the partnership at my firm. 
And uh, I had actually been the acting managing partner at that time. The, the real managing partner had been sick. And uh, so I had uh, been quite active in the management and God, they got on the phone and said, are you nuts? And, uh, and why, why could you possibly do this? And, um, and so there was a little bit of, <laughs> little bit of tension there. Uh, but um, but uh, that was the that was the day that I was appointed. Wow, <laughs> that is that that's exciting and also stressful at the same time because you're yeah. literally in the middle of a proceeding, and it's like I can't even do anything with this witness anymore. I'm like, but it's five p.m. and then. <laughs> that's oh, right. wow. Yeah. Wow. yeah! Wow! Yeah! Wow! That is that is that is amazing and. I would also imagine that that first time that you stepped into the federal court as a judge, that would have been also been an amazing and an exciting experience as well. What did you feel in that moment when you stepped into that court for the first time? Well, I was sworn in on August the 6th and I had my first case on August 11th. And as I tell people, there were no training wheels in those days. Uh, you just, you, you just got thrown into your first case. It was a very, very high profile case called uh, the Information Commissioner versus the Prime Minister, Prime Minister Mulroney. And, um, and uh, that was the year of the, they called it the Charlottetown Accord. And there was a, uh, there was going to be a national unity referendum that year. And the government had done polling and had done focus groups. Uh, on this subject of national unity and the press wanted to get hold of all of that, the polling and the focus groups and uh, the government didn't want to release it. And under the Access to Information Act, uh, there, there are certain grounds on which the government can refuse uh, issues of national security or federal provincial relations or uh, other, there are a list of reasons uh, that the government can, can refuse to disclose. So that's what the case was about. And because it was so high profile, you can imagine that I had the best lawyers in the country there arguing the case. And I was sitting there as a judge. I had never heard of the Access to Information Act. Uh, I had these wonderful lawyers appearing before me uh, on a subject matter that I knew nothing about. And I sat there and I, I, I know I was saying to myself, I think I made a hell of a mistake. And uh, it, it, was, it was pretty challenging. And uh, anyway, uh, somehow the, the, case, it was a, the case went for a couple of days and then, uh, and then uh, we adjourned and I reserved. And I could tell you the story of what happened to that case if you want to know, but... Uh, uh, but that, that was my first case. Wow. That, that, that is really interesting. I mean, the case, I would like to more, to learn more about that case because that case is, yeah. What happened exactly? Well, uh, here's the story. Um, I reserved judgment. I had a law clerk and I was given 1400 pages of polls and focus groups to go through to see whether, they were uh, there were issues of national security or federal provincial relations or other reasons that could uh, uh, justify not disclosing all that uh, all that information. And uh, so while the case was under reserve and we were I was working with my law clerk on all of that material, um, I got a call from a member of parliament from Manitoba and he said, "Come over to the parliamentary dining room for lunch." And I said, geez, I've got this uh, high profile case involving the government and I, I think I, I should get the judgment out and, and I'll call you back once the judgment's out. And so eventually the judgment was released and I found against the government. And I said they did not justify uh, withholding disclosure and they had to disclose. Anyway, uh, I, I called the MP and he said, oh, okay, come on over. And uh, I went over. And I was sitting at a round table with five or six MPs and senators, uh, all Mulroney government uh, members. And um, it was a very nice lunch. And um, uh, after lunch, we all got up to leave. And, um, and one of the MPs uh, said, we sit down. 
So we all sat down. So I said, uh, well, why, why do we have to sit down? And he said, well, Prime Minister Mulroney is down at the end of a, the room uh, with constituents taking pictures. And so I said, well, that's okay. We can just, we won't bother him. We'll just walk around. And he said, well, you don't understand. He said, you know, after that decision that in the access case came down and he found against the government, the prime minister came up to me and said, didn't we just appoint that son of a b-? <laughs> <laughs> And he said, we can't be seen with you. And, and I said to myself, I shouldn't be seen with you. <laughs> and that's the last time I went to the parliamentary dining room, I can tell you. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> the, the, the upshot is, and I don't want to make more of it than it is, but, um, you know, when you become a judge, whatever your political leanings or associations or friends were when you were before you begin a judge, that's, that's over. And when you become a judge, you're independent and you have to call, call the balls and strikes as you see them. And, uh, and when the facts and the law require that you find against the government, well, that's where you've got to go. And that's what I had to do in that case. Uh, so it was, a, it was a lesson in judicial independence. Absolutely. Judicial independence. I was just about to say that. That is, well, that's a great example of judicial independence. You, it went, like you mentioned, if you, if you do find, based on the evidence in front of you, that you have to find against the government, you're going to have to do that. And you have to do that for it very, very strongly when as strong as you can possibly do and reason, reasonably do, I should rather say, on the evidence of the circumstances. That's a hallmark of our Canadian judicial system and really our Canadian legal system. Without it, we, the fairness in our systems would be severely, severely limited and hampered. But yeah, absolutely important. Well, you know, especially in the federal court, because in the federal court, many, many, many cases are, are involve the government. And, um, and, and some, most cases aren't high profile, but uh, this case was particularly high profile, but, uh, but it's true. I mean, judicial independence is something that we shouldn't be taking for granted and that we should value. Uh, you can imagine in many countries around the world that, uh, that there, is, there isn't the kind of independence that we enjoy in this country and, uh, and it shouldn't be taken for granted. Yes, yes, absolutely. And you would enjoy so much, so many years in the federal court and the federal court of appeal. And then, of course, we would go to the next part of your career. You would apply to become a Supreme Court justice. How was the process like? What was the procedure like? And what did you have to go through in those days? to become a Supreme Court Justice? Well, uh, in the, this was 2000, it, it, I was appointed in 2006, but Jack Major was my predecessor. He was the prairie judge on the Supreme Court. And uh, as, as you will know, the Supreme Court is regionally diverse. Uh, generally, they try to have one from the Maritimes, three from Quebec, three from Ontario, one from the Prairies, and one from British Columbia. That's a, it's a little looser now, but certainly when I was appointed, that's the way it was. So when Jack Major, I mean, everybody knew that he was going to retire because judges are mandatorily retired at 75, and so he was 75. Um, and uh, so there was no application. Uh, but what happened was that... Uh, uh, my name and the name of a number of other people were, were being publicly discussed. And, um, and actually, uh, at one point, I was asked to submit uh, a list of my cases or some cases that I, I, I was prepared to have a vetting committee look at, I guess. And uh, so I submitted the, the cases. But for a lot of reasons, um, I, the, the, the Minister of Justice was Erwin Kotler, 
uh, and the prime minister was uh, Paul Martin. And for a lot of reasons, I didn't think that I had any chance of being appointed to the Supreme Court. Um, and um, and uh, so I, I did submit those cases and uh, people would ask me if I would accept the position if it was offered. And I said, yeah, I, I'd accept it, but I'm enjoying myself in the Federal Court of Appeal and I'm I, it's not going to be devastating if I don't get appointed, but I really didn't think I'd be appointed. Well, Prime Minister Harper got appointed, uh, or got elected on uh, July on, Ju- on January 23rd of 2006. And that's when I started to think that um, maybe things could be different for me. And he called me on February the 10th. And he, I, I was in Toronto and um, on cases. And um, he called me, and it was the same routine as before. I was called at four o'clock, and I was asked if I'd take a call from the prime minister at five o'clock. And I said, yes. And he called me at five o'clock, and he said, now, I'm prepared to appoint you to the Supreme Court, but you've got to agree to two things. First, you've got to agree to not disclose this until the government's ready to disclose it. And that was going to be easy for me. And then he said, you have to go through a parliamentary hearing. And he had he had campaigned in his election campaign on the fact that Supreme Court judges should have to go through a parliamentary committee, and that had never been done before. And uh, <laughs> I was very, I, I didn't want to do that, but <laughs> I, I didn't refuse. And I, uh, I agreed that I would go through the parliamentary committee. And so, uh, I, and I had to go through a lot of preparation. Uh, I can tell you about that if you're, if you're interested. Um, but uh, eventually there was a parliamentary committee. I said he had called me on February 10th. I think the parliamentary committee was on February 27th. And he appointed me or confirmed, appointed me on March the uh, 1st. So that was the... Uh, uh, that was kind of the 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 process. I, in Toronto, my my one of my sons and his girlfriend were living in Toronto at the time, and I was scheduled to have dinner with them that night, and I did, and, but I couldn't disclose anything. But they knew that I was agitated, and uh, uh, but I, I couldn't say anything to them. So we had a we kind of had a silent dinner. <laughs> and, uh, and, <laughs> But it, it was fine, and um, and that's that's what occurred. Well, I mean, with something this major, I mean, with something this major, and I, I'm very sure that I mean, anyone would understand. It's like, wow, like something big is, is definitely going to be happening. I mean, it, it's also the biggest, the greatest advancement of your entire career. And yeah, you mentioned about that preparation for the parliamentary committee. I, I would like to. To know more about that, I, I, what did you have to do to prepare? Because I couldn't imagine that was. I mean, you mentioned like you know you couldn't refuse, but you were kind of like, eh, you know, didn't necessarily want to to do that committee to to be a part of the committee. What did you have to do to prepare for that hearing? Well, uh, the the government uh, provided a couple of assistance to me. Um, uh, they gave me a former uh, deputy minister of justice who would uh, prepare uh, poss- possible questions for me to answer. And uh, they appointed or they, they got Peter Hogg, the former uh, dean of law at uh, Osgood, who's now died, uh, to assist me on constitutional matters. And uh, I met Peter Hogg on the side. Of course, I couldn't tell anybody what was going on, uh, but I, and, and I was still hearing cases in the Federal Court of Appeal. I couldn't tell them what was going on. So I was hearing cases in Toronto, and I, I went on Saturday, and I met Peter Hogg on a Sunday morning. And he walked me through all, not all, but a number of the controversial charter cases up to 2006. He explained to me the majorities, the majority reasons, the dissent reasons, and the controversial cases. And um, and he, he's the best, he's got to be one of the best teachers I ever had. In three hours, we walked through 
a number of the cases, and he explained in the clearest possible way what the rationale of the majority was, the rationale of the dissent. And, you know, I knew some of the cases, but I certainly didn't know everything that he told me. And, uh, and so that was part of the preparation. Uh, George Thompson, the former Deputy Minister of Justice, uh, uh, came to my, well, he gave me a list of, I don't know, 100 questions that might be asked. And I, I actually wrote out the answers. And he came to my condo um, in Ottawa uh, the Saturday before this hearing that was to take place on the Monday. And he, so he said, okay, I'll, I'll ask you a question. And I said, fine. And I had a binder of all of my answers uh, uh, in this binder. And he uh, asked his first question. It was about Aboriginal law. And, uh, and I went to page 59 of my binder. And as I was listening to his question, I was looking at the answer that I had written on page 59. And the answer wasn't responsive to the question he was asking. And I said, this isn't going to work. And uh, I said to him, George, you don't have to leave this with me. And, and he left. And I read and reread the the, the answers that I had put in this binder. And then I threw away the binder. I shouldn't say I threw it away, but I didn't use the binder. And I realized that I, I had to be ready to answer questions that I, I, I didn't know what they were going to ask, but uh, I had to be ready. And, uh, and so I went to the parliamentary hearing without, well, I did take the binder for some questions, constitutional questions, and, you know, a few controversial things that I thought might be answered. The other thing that I did was that I um, had my secretary, my wife, and my law clerk listening to the radio and TV because, because this was the first time there was going to be a parliamentary hearing that was very, it was a very high profile news, news newsworthy issue. Uh, the reporters were all asking the MPs on the on the committee that were going to be on this parliamentary committee what questions they were going to ask. So I had my my wife and my secretary and my law clerk listening to all of that and coming to me with all the questions that they said they were going to ask. And indeed, they asked some, and and uh, and, so, and some I could answer, and some I couldn't answer. Uh, you know, I couldn't answer what. The, what my, my position would be on a future case and so on. But, but basically, I tried to, to be as responsive as I could. So, so that was the nature of the, um, the preparation. But it was excruciating. Look, you're aware, uh, all lawyers, all law students, everybody is aware of the advice and consent process in the United States. And everybody knows how rigorous that is and how... How difficult that can be. I mean, you remember uh, the Brett Kavanaugh uh, appointment where they went back 35 or 40 years uh, to when he was a teenager and uh, there was an allegation of some sexual impropriety. And, uh, you know, that I, look, I, I, I always say I had enough trouble getting dates in high school and university that I behaved myself. So I wasn't worried about sexual impropriety, but I, I didn't know what what somebody might come up with. You know, oh, uh, we were told that you were at a party in such and such a year, and you said this, or that happened, or there was too much drinking, or you know, whatever uh, whatever might come up. And uh, the problem was, as, as I say, there there was no bounds to relevance. So, you know, you can be asked anything about your, your history or, or your experiences, things that you probably lo have long forgotten. And so it was scary in that sense. I wasn't worried about answering the, the questions that I prepared for, the kind of uh, legal questions, but, you know, there were, there were issues uh, that uh, you, you, just because you just didn't know what kind of personal questions might be asked, uh, that uh, that it was, it was kind of scary. And it's also scary, as you mentioned, that these are events that could have happened so many years ago that 
either you've forgotten about them or even worse, they could have maybe, maybe, you know, maybe those that has never happened. You don't recall that ever happening at all in the first place. And that it is excruciating in this respect, as well as, as the other portions of the questioning as well. I, I was just watching over Justice Moldaver's questioning at the time he was appointed as Supreme Court Justice in 2011. And I, I remember just seeing the questions about his language, his bilingualism at the time, because uh, b- because they were asking him about his, his proficiency in French. And I'm, I'm sitting here thinking, wow, these are actually very difficult. I mean, that, that question may have been not as difficult as maybe like the personal questions, but but that was still a, a difficult question because, you know, I mean, that's relating to a very specific, a very important skill to have as a Supreme Court justice to be able to work in both English and French. But I'm always struck by how, you know, the answers to those questions, like there are great questions, but there are even better answers to them as well. You know, and I think I remember Justice Moldaver at the time saying that, you know, the reason why he wasn't he didn't have the opportunity to improve his French was because never in a million years or in his wildest dreams would he have ever thought that he would be at the Supreme Court as a Supreme Court judge. You know, if he went had a time machine, went back or a crystal ball and someone told him that he would have this very hearing, he would not squander any of that opportunities to learn French. But, you know, like, I mean, and if, to be honest, like, I don't think, I think most people wouldn't have imagined themselves even nowadays as one day I'll be a Supreme Court judge. You know, it just kind of happens as you know, life has its way, and sometimes some people do have that opportunity to become a Supreme Court judge, such as in your case, uh, Justice Rothstein. So it's kind of like it, that's why I'm, I'm I'm so fascinated by once again like the answers because those questions can come way out of left field, but the answers would be on the spot, but still so good that they can. It's as if that it's as if they've been prepared long in advance, and also anticipated in advance as well. And that's something that I'm always fascinated by, you know, justices like yourself, Justice Rothstein, at being prepared, even when it doesn't seem like it, on, on your case, it seems like to me as a lay person, the answers that are so good towards those questions. Well, you know, if you, in my case, I, I think if you prepare well, it's like going to court as counsel. If you are very, very well prepared and you're asked questions that come out of left field or, or you weren't expecting, if you've prepared well and you've internalized the subject sufficiently, you're probably in a pretty good position to provide a, a cogent answer, a decent answer, uh, even to something that you hadn't anticipated. Uh, so, so it certainly, uh, it, 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 your preparation takes you beyond the precise work that you prepared and just makes you makes you smarter, frankly, about the, the, the areas that you might be asked about that you didn't prepare for. Definitely. And after all this, this questioning and after the hearing, you would step foot into the Supreme Court for the very first time as a judge. Describe that very moment. What were you feeling in that moment when you stepped into that courthouse for the first time and you heard your very first Supreme Court case as a Supreme Court judge? What was that moment like? Well, it wasn't quite as dramatic as you uh, say, because my first case wasn't in the courtroom. My first case um, was called Robertson versus the Globe and Mail. And it was a case that had been heard by the Supreme Court before I came to the court. To the court, And Justice Major had sat on the case, but he had retired. And uh, uh, Supreme Court judges are given six months to write, to write judgments or agree to other judgments. And then, then they're functus, they're, they're done. And six months had gone by. And the court was evenly split on that case for judges in favor of Globe, four judges in favor of Robertson. And the Chief Justice came to me and she said, uh, look, she said, would you agree to uh, watch the oral hearing uh, on video 
And would you agree to read the factums? And would you agree to cast the deciding vote? Uh, and um, she said, of course, the parties will have to agree to this. But if they do, would you agree to do that? Well, what was I going to say? Of course, I agreed. Uh, but I told her that there could be a problem. And she said, well, what, what's, what's the problem? I said, well, Heather Robertson, uh, the, the, the party, Heather Robertson and I went to school together in Winnipeg when I was young. And in high school, I, I had even taken her out a couple of times. And in university, uh, she became the editor of the newspaper, uh, the student newspaper, the Manitoba. And I, as I told you earlier, became the president of the student union. But in the election campaign, the, the, the paper came out against me. And, uh, and they uh, were writing articles uh, that were slanted against me and took pictures that made me look cockeyed. And it was all fake news, but that's what they were doing. And, I, uh, and after I became president, um, uh, I cut their budget. I mean, it was politics. I mean, you know, it was politics at the university, just as there politics elsewhere. And, and so I said to the Chief Justice, I said, you know, I don't think Heather's going to be too keen about me uh, being one of the people to decide the case in view of this history that we've had. And uh, she said, well, we'll ask the parties and see what they say. So a letter went to the parties and and immediately we got a letter back from Heather Robertson's counsel saying, Heather Robertson and Marshall Rothstein were wonderful friends in high school and university. And they wanted to disclose this to the Globe so that if the Globe is concerned about it, uh, uh, they should know. And the Globe came back and said, we don't care. And so she said, fine, you'll, you'll cast the deciding vote. And, uh, and indeed I did. And, and in fact, I decided in favor of Heather. I sometimes say that maybe I owed it to her after cutting her budget at university. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, as, it, as it turns out, uh, that, was, that was my first case. And uh, Heather obviously had a, a more sanguine view of our relationship than I did, but I was fine. And, uh, and that was my first case. Wow. <laughs> well, I mean, that is quite a very, I mean, dramatic would be, wouldn't be the word to use, but that was, that certainly was a very, very unique or distinctive start as a Supreme Court when a judge, judge when your first case is essentially with someone that, you know, you essentially used to have a personal connection with that. That's a very, very interesting story. And it was uh, yeah, just very coincidental. I, I didn't tell you that the case was a copyright case. And the issue was who had the copyright over compilations of Heather Robertson's work. Um, it, apparently after some time, uh, I think the Globe compiled uh, all of her articles and uh, uh, together. And the question was whether the Globe owned that or had that copyright or whether she did. And I found that she did. And so that was what the case was about. I should have told you earlier. Yep. And for our, our audience, you can definitely search up the case as well. And on, on your free time, that that's certainly yeah. a very, a very interesting case that I, I would want to learn more about as well as I read on my own ledger time as well. What was a day in the life of a Supreme Court justice like returning back to your career? What was it like? What was your schedule like as Supreme Court Justice Marshall Rothstein? Well, I'll give you my experience. And, you know, I'm sure that other judges had similar experiences. Um, I, I go to the gym in my condo building uh, at five in the morning. I always have done that. I do it in the morning because then there's no excuse. You have to do it. And I recommend to other people that they do that too. And I would come back up and shower and have breakfast. And uh, I would uh, go to the office. Actually, what I would do is... Uh, uh, I would uh, call my court attendant and I would uh, tell him that I would meet him at Starbucks, which was right outside the Supreme Court building, or at least right down Kent Street, I think it was Kent. And, um, and so uh, 
I would leave my house, uh, my condo at about 6.50. I would uh, meet him at Starbucks. He would go into Starbucks and get my drink and my coffee. And uh, he would jump in the car and we'd just drive to the, to the Supreme Court. And uh, I'd go up to my office and it would depend whether it was a sitting day or not. If it was a sitting day, I would be reading and preparing, continuing to prepare for the, uh, for the case that was being heard that day. If it was, uh, the, the, the court sits two weeks on and two weeks off. And, and so if it was a sitting day, it's what I told you. If it wasn't a sitting day in one of the two weeks that was off, I'd either be writing judgment that I had been assigned to write, or I'd be reading for the next two weeks of cases. And uh, that was kind of the, the, the general patter in, uh, in, uh, in the, uh, on the two weeks that are off. And, um, and, and so that, that, on, on the two weeks that were off, you'd be doing that pretty much all day, probably a combination of writing a, a, a decision and preparing. And, um, and uh, I'd leave the office at around 5 or 5.30 or 6 or so and I'd come home. And I'd, al- I'd always have to bring something home to work on. I mean, it was a very hard job, I can tell you. Nobody knows how hard those judges work at the Supreme Court, but uh, I'd uh, bring work home. I'd, um, I'd, I'd have dinner and play Scrabble with my wife for an hour and a half, and th- then she'd go and read or watch TV, and uh, I would uh, work for a couple of hours. So that was the, that was the nature of, of the day. Now, wow. I, I left out of it. I mean, I would meet with my law clerks and have emails with them and things like that, but that was generally the way it was. Wow, that is a very busy day, but also a very disciplined day as well. I mean, you mentioned that you had to go to the gym at 5 a.m. in the morning. That is very important for us because, you know, it's especially nowadays we talk about mental health and physical health as well. And gym, going to the gym is one of those important things as well. Personally, I go to the gym. Well, I say go to the gym, but I actually work out at home because I have enough equipment to work out at home. I, I, work out typically in at around the evenings like 6 p.m or 7 p.m or, or so and it's about an hour an hour and a half or so and it's important to have this kind of uh, this balance and this kind of structure that keeps you on your toes that keeps you focused it also keeps you on task as well and like you mentioned justice rothstein the job of a supreme court justice is very very difficult especially since your decisions would affect the course of Canadian legal history and also affect Canadians in general, both in the short term and in the long term. So how did you maintain balance during your time as Supreme Court justice? And what makes a good Supreme Court justice? Gosh, uh, you know, uh, just let me, let me answer you in two bites. Uh, first of all, I had three rules when I hired law clerks. Uh, they couldn't, first of all, they couldn't be involved in political activity. Secondly, they had to be prepared to work on weekends because I worked on weekends. And third, they had to exercise every day. And for the very reasons that you said, you've got to have a balance in your life. And you, you know, law is a sitting down job. And so for your physical and your mental well-being, you've got to exercise. And that was, I call that a, a conditions of employment. You know, I might be taken to the labor board in another uh, circumstance, but, uh, but that's, that's what I required. Um, and, and so that was, um, that, that was quite important. Um, gosh, you know, when you say what, what does it take to be a good Supreme Court judge? You've got to be objective. You've got to, you, you, you can't, you've got to, we all bring baggage to our jobs. We all bring our experiences to our jobs. And it's inevitable that they will have some impact on the way in which you decide some cases. But you kind of have to try to suppress that as much as possible because you have to decide as objectively as, as you possibly can. 
And, and I think most judges do that. But, gosh, the judges work hard, and you've got to be prepared to work very hard and, uh, and, and spend the time. You know, the cases are, I used to say at the Court of Appeal, 60% of the cases you could dismiss from the bench. I mean, there was no leave, out, leave process. So a lot of the stuff wasn't very serious. 30% uh, you had to write, but you kind of knew what you were going to write when you left the courtroom. And 10% were hard. And at the Supreme Court, because of the leave process, 100% are hard. And, uh, you know, from re for you or anybody else reading the Supreme Court cases, you can see that they're very, very uh, difficult, nuanced, uh, subtle cases. And, um, and uh, uh, they just take a, an awful lot of work and a lot of preparation on, on the part of the judges. So, um, so you just got to be prepared to put in the time. You got to try to be objective, and uh, and, um, and that's you know. I mean, I, I suppose I could list off some other things, but uh, those are the basic components. Certainly, and also considering just all the work that lawyers had to put in to prepare for such a case, hang this high up into the court system. Like I, I can even imagine how how giant the factums are and yeah just putting in that amount of work is is and even more than that is certainly so it's very very important and as it also comes naturally with as a condition of employment so to speak like, like you mentioned with the job as a supreme court justice and having served for nine years though Despite being so busy, I mean, I would imagine that there were so many great memories that, that you've had during your time as Supreme Court Justice. What do you miss the most from that time? Well, you know, when you're working with eight other judges, uh, they become your, your friends. And uh, so when you say, what do you miss the most? I, I, I live in Vancouver now. I miss my friends. I, I was actually in Ottawa uh, two or three weeks ago at a, at a Supreme Court dinner, so I got to see them, and it was nice, and uh, and I enjoyed that. So I I I miss my friends. Um, you know, sometimes I'll read a decision and I'll say, "Geez, I don't think I agree with that decision." So you know, sometimes you think of that, but. Uh, but I, I should say mostly I do agree with the with the decisions that they were rendered. I, I shouldn't say mostly. The vast majority of the decisions I, I do agree with. Um, uh, but uh, but it was rigorous work, and uh, and I enjoyed my my time there. It was the, the, you can imagine the best job I ever had, and um, and uh, so between my friends and me and the quality of the work and it was, it was a, a special opportunity for me certainly was a very special opportunity and you've left your mark on on our courts as well on our legal history and the legacy i'm very sure that lawyers will be talking about this for for years to come i'm glad you mentioned that you've made so many friends at the supreme court of canada because my next question talks about the art of civil disagreement. There are so many instances where you would have disagreed with your fellow justices on, again, many issues, and you're still their friend. This is a great example of disagreeing while not being disagreeable, as in my conversation previously with Governor General David Johnston has shown, he, Mr. Johnston has told me this, you know, you can disagree with someone and not be disagreeable. Sadly, I think a lot of Canadians have forgotten this very, very important virtue. And I realized, I'm not sure this is a cultural thing because I, I'm of Chinese descent. I'm a second generation, generation Canadian born Chinese person. For me, how I was raised was that if you're debating with somebody, it's not that one side is completely right and the other side's completely wrong. It's actually that both sides are right and wrong to varying degrees. I'm not sure that's a cultural difference, but I mean, 
with that kind of experience that I personally had, and returning to your experience, having made so many friends, but still disagreeing with them, but still remaining friends, how can Canadians relearn the art of civil disagreement? And what examples from your career, from all aspects of your career, would you want people to remember in regards to disagreeing civilly? Um, <clears throat> I, I'm going to tell you a story. <clears throat> uh, before I came to the court, the, the court decided a case called um, uh, health service called health services, British Columbia Health Services, in which the court, on the basis of Section 2D of the Charter, said that there was a constitutional right to collective bargaining. That issue came back in a case called Fraser in about 2010 or 2011 when I was there. And I disagreed with, with that proposition. I did not see how, uh, how you could derive from freedom of association uh, a constitutional right to collective bargaining. You certainly, look, Freedom of expression means you can say whatever you want, but you can't force you to listen. Freedom of religion means that you can have whatever religion you want, but you can't force me to be part of your religion. And the government can't stop me from having my religion. And freedom of association to me means that if you and I can agree on a political view, we can form a political party. If we uh, can agree on wanting to read books, we can form a book club. You know, we can do whatever we want voluntarily, but we can't impose it on anyone else. And to me, collective bargaining is imposing an obligation on employers. And uh, I, I say that a freedom in Section 2 of the Charter doesn't, doesn't uh, impose obligations on others. Um, and, and, and can't impose obligations on others. So I disagreed that there's, there should be a constitutional right to collective bargaining. I, I should say I'm not opposed to collective bargaining, uh, but, I, but I say that should be a matter of legislation, not a matter of constitutional law. Anyway, uh, as I said, it came back in this Fraser case, and I wrote, it was, it was a, a dissent, but it turned out to be a concurrence for reasons I don't have to get into, but, but uh, for all intents and purposes of dissent. And Justice, Chief Justice McLaughlin and Justice LaBelle wrote the majority and I was in dissent. And the language as we were exchanging uh, drafts, the language got pretty hot. And the Chief Justice came to me and she said, uh, she said, look, the language is getting a little strong. Why don't we exchange drafts and mark in the margin where we think the language is a little too strong in each other's reasons, and maybe we can tone it down. And um, and I said, sure, that's that's fine. And um, and so that's what we decided to do. Well, in that case, I felt that the supreme that the majority had really gone off the rails and had made stuff up. That, that wasn't legitimate. And I remember saying to my law clerk, do you remember, um, uh, do you remember Humpty Dumpty? Words mean what I want them to mean. And I remember turning by computer and I went into Google and I typed in words mean what I want them to mean. And up comes Lewis Carroll, Alice Through the Looking Glass, and words mean Humpty Dumpty, words mean what I want them to mean. And I said, I'm going to use that. And so my law clerk left, and I started to write that into the in, into my reasons, and um, and uh, then I got cold feet, and I figured, oh, maybe this is going too far, and I called my law clerk and I said, look, I want you to search and see whether these Humpty Dumpty words have been used in any other case, and lo and behold, he came back and he said, yes. Uh, they had been used by Lord Atkin in a case called Liversidge versus Anderson, which was a civil liberties case in the United Kingdom during the Second World War, where they interned uh, people without, uh, without habeas corpus. And, 
Lord Atkin was in dissent, and he used those Humpty Dumpty words when we were about that to me. And so I said to my Lord Clerk, bingo, we're going to use it, but we're not going to call it Humpty Dumpty. We're going to call it Lord Atkin. We're going to say Lord Atkin. We're going to say Lord Atkin used these words from Humpty Dumpty, and that's, that's what we're going to do. So uh, I did that. And so that was in my reasons. So when, when, when the Chief Justice and I exchanged drafts, um, uh, I got her, I got my draft back with her marginal comments. And uh, so she put an X here or a you know, no there or as she was going through. And when she came to the Humpty Dumpty stuff, she wrote, ouch. <laughs> <laughs> and I took it out. And, you know, in retrospect, Lord Atkin didn't take it out. And now I'm sorry I took it out. But, <laughs> uh, but uh, I did take it out. And I'm telling you the story because it's an example of collegiality. You know, I made the point. I didn't need to, you know, it wasn't essential for me to use the Humpty Dumpty stuff. And, uh, and, 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 and the whole process, we toned down our reasons, each of us, so that we weren't too vitriolic against the other. Now, you, you have to say why you're disagreeing, but, uh, but uh, you, you don't have to make it too colorful. And uh, so that was an example of collegiality. Um, the, the, the most important thing when you're working together and you're trying to be civil is that you've got to have respect for each other. And, you know, you can disagree, but you can't ridicule somebody. You can't, uh, uh, you, you can't um, say that they're stupid and things like that. There's got to be respect. And when I was there, there was. Uh, and and each of us respected each other. Now, that's not to say that I didn't go into the next office to a judge and say, I don't know what the other side is thinking about. They must be nuts. And, um, and uh, you, know, I, you know, I'm human and we're all humans. So you say that to somebody privately, but you don't, you're, you're respectful with the people who you're disagreeing with. And that's the most important thing. And, and we were. And, um, and it was that respect that, uh, that allowed us to be collegial. And, and, and I attribute a lot of this to the Chief Justice, to Chief, Chief Justice McLaughlin. You know, we would, uh, there was a lunch room where the, the judges eat lunch together. Uh, we'd have parties or dinners uh, frequently amongst the judges, sometimes all the judges, sometimes a few judges. It's pretty hard to, to be uncivil when you're eating and drinking with somebody. And, um, and so I, I attribute that to the chief, that she, she knew that. And, um, and it, it helped keep things under, under control. I don't think it was always that way at the Supreme Court of Canada. I think in prior years, there was a lot of tension sometimes between different judges. But when I was there, it was pretty civil. I, I'm not telling you that it was perfect. You know, there were occasions where, you know, things got a little off the rails. But, but 99, 98% of the time, that wouldn't be the case. That's great to hear. That's really good to hear. And I think your your comment on respect that is such an important reminder i think for really anyone whether or not they're in law they we rather all have to remember and to remind ourselves of that whether if we're talking with friends family or even just acquaintances we need to remember to respect others because that's something that sadly in the last 20 years, I think we've lost a lot of that kind of respect for each other where, and sadly, like, I've even experienced this in my own personal situation, even during my time in law school, where there was absolutely no respect. And I'm not going to go into the, de to the details of that as well, but there was just, ab just, just absolutely no respect for the other side's position or not even just the position even for where they're coming from you know if they're going through something personal there were moments where i saw that there wasn't even respect for that where people were actually laughing at stuff like that 
and that's a personal circumstance that is uncontrollable, that's there's no respect in that. And how are you supposed to to have a proper conversation when there's this obvious open rudeness towards someone? That's not civil disagreement. If anything, that's just you're asking to divide yourself from that other person completely and cause a massive rift. And again, this is something that I think has become more and more of a problem in the last 20 years. And we need to remind ourselves of that. I think all of us have have a role to remind ourselves and to improve ourselves in this particular area. And I think your example has been really perfect, a great example of what we can learn from to improve ourselves. Well, it's something to remember for sure. So as we come to the to the end of our episode, of our interview, I do have one final question. And that question is, what is your advice to current and future law students on mastering their post-COVID careers? Because as we all know at this point, COVID has changed literally everything, even how we practice the law and how we advance our legal careers. Whether or not law students choose to go into legal practice or into something else, what can they do right now to make themselves more effective professionals in the near and far future? Well, you're right that the pandemic has changed a lot. You know, we're, here, here we are doing a Zoom call. Uh, you know, before the pandemic, uh, this couldn't, the, nobody would think of doing this. And uh, we'd have to get together in a room. And, you know, I, I have to say, I prefer to be in a room together, but, you know, sometimes it's not practical. And so, you know, some, some, of, some of that has turned out to be quite useful uh, as we go forward. Um, look, when you ask an old judge, an old lawyer, what, uh, what kind of advice he's got, you know, I got 20, 20 pieces of advice. I got 40 pieces of advice, but, but let, me, let me just boil it down to a few. Uh, you know, rule one is preparation and hard work. You know, there's no, no such thing as inspiration coming to you in the courtroom. Uh, you've got to prepare and you've got to go up and down and sideways on the facts and on the law. If you're doing commercial work, you have to, you have to research and, and look at all aspects of the transactions you're dealing with. And you've got to take advice from other people. You have to be prepared. It, it, nothing happens without preparation. That's the most important thing I can tell you. But there's, there's, there's other things. I told you about my experience as a human rights adjudicator. So a uh, second point, make a point of gaining experience. Always take on uh, every opportunity that comes along, uh, even if it involves some financial sacrifice. It's worthwhile uh, taking taking. Uh, taking the opportunities that come along. Third, learn from your mistakes. Don't be overly defensive. You know, when you're when you're a young lawyer and you're starting out, mistakes are going to happen. And uh, and when when they happen, don't don't be defensive. Accept that their mistakes have happened, and um, and and you know they're usually not as serious as you might think. But accept the fact that, that mistakes can occur and learn from them. Next, uh, make sure you have a mentor. Uh, somebody is prepared to help you move forward in the profession and to teach you good judgment. Uh, you know, there are too many, I shouldn't say too many, but there are lawyers who didn't have a mentor and somehow they get off the rails and things don't work so well for them. You always have to have a mentor. It doesn't have to be somebody in your own firm. It can be somebody else. But you have to have somebody who you can go and talk problems over with. And, uh, and uh, mentorship is really, really important. You know, I can tell you that in the big firms, uh, they make sure that the young lawyers are mentored. And, uh, and it's important for, for, for young lawyers. Um, 
I say in the first few years, don't worry about the money. Don't don't be don't be too aggressive with uh, with asking for salary increases and things like that. Now you have to appreciate that it comes from an old guy who was involved in the management of law firms, and so I was sitting on the other side of the table. But I can tell you that sitting on the other side of the table and having an argument about money is not that doesn't endear you to to the firm or or enhance your future. The firms are competitive. You may be a little bit over, a little bit under the market, uh, but to extract a few extra dollars isn't, isn't really worth it. In 10 years, you won't even look back. You, you, it just will be a, a drop in the bucket for you, and uh, it's not worth it. I, I, I accept that, uh, that the cost of living is very high, especially in places like Toronto and Vancouver and Ottawa. Um, but um, the, as I say, the firms are competitive, and as a general rule, you should, you should be okay. I, I'm not talking about being underpaid, and you know, if you're in a firm where where they're just taking advantage of you, obviously you have to stand up for for that. But but as a general rule, the firms are competitive. Um, never compromise your ethical standards. You know. You, inevitably, you're going to be asked by a client to do something that you can't do, and you you cannot succumb to that. It may be an important client, uh, and you may feel a great conflict. You don't want to lose the client, but you can't do things that are unethical. If you are in doubt about it, you you, you speak to somebody else in the office or speak always speak to somebody else and they will tell you in a more objective way what the right course is. And by the way, if you're being asked to do something unethical and the client leaves you, they're not, or, or the client proposes to leave you, they're not going to find another lawyer to do something unethical. So, you know, you, you've got to maintain your ethical standards. You can't, you cannot compromise that under any circumstances. That is a uh, that's a career buster, and uh, you know I mean I, I just as I say that uh, I'm reminded of the leak of the Alito judgment at uh, uh, at the U.S. Supreme Court involving Roe v. Wade, and uh, I'm sure they're going to find out who who leaked, and if it's a law clerk, and I I think the the conventional wisdom is that it is, uh, that person's career is over. Don't compromise your ethical standards under any circumstances. You got to turn a disadvantage into advantage. Um, if, if you're a human being, you're going to have things that uh, are going to be setbacks and disadvantages. And you can't let them tear you down or disturb you. You have to move on. You simply have to move on, and and that's and that's that's all you can do. You can't wallow in victimhood, or recrimination, or bitterness, or anger. You have to move on. You asked me earlier about civility, and your civility in the court system amongst judges, but civility amongst lawyers is is critical. You know, complaints to the law society, complaints by judges, uh, abuse of that sort, it, it doesn't get you anywhere. Uh, there's no advantage to being a hothead. All that is is poor judgment, which is the last thing that a lawyer needs. And, and I'll, I'll stop giving advice with one more, and that is you have to be scrupulously honest. It takes time to make a successful career and to gain a reputation. It can be lost in a flash. You just can't allow that to happen on account of any, any challenge to your sense of honesty. And so you've got, to, you've got to be scrupulously honest all the time. I could go on, but I think that's, you, you, you got the, my, my top 10 or top eight or whatever it is with that. You know, that, that's, that's great advice, especially the last part, honesty. Honesty, and that's something that 
Mr. Martin, when I, I had uh, Prime Minister Paul Martin on an earlier episode uh, a year and a half ago, and he told me one of the most important things that he learned from his time working with with Paul Desmarais was honesty is the best policy, you know, in, in anything you do. And I would even go as far as to say honesty is so important, even when the truth hurts, right? There are often going to be times where the truth hurts to hear, where it's it it. it it challenges how we think. It challenges how we perceive the law or even perceive life. But for us to be better people, to be better lawyers, better legal professionals, we need to be susceptible. We need to be not susceptible. We need to be attentive and willing to accept very different viewpoints and accept the fact that the truth often isn't always what we expect it to be that the truth will hurt, the truth will be difficult to hear, but the truth will set you free. And that's something that I think is so important for all of us to remember. Well, I think that's true. And, uh, you know, we, we might just uh, unpack it just a little bit to say, look, there's no question you have to be honest about facts. You know, if something is true in fact, it's true. You can't, you, you can't fudge that. But you also have to be intellectually honest as well. And as a lawyer, you, when you're looking at your cases, you, you can't get mesmerized by the, the, the sympathy or the wisdom of, of your client. You have to look very objectively and, and intellectually at the case and, and try to be as intellect, intellectually honest as you possibly can be. And uh, that's, that's very critical. A very critical skill as well, and a skill that, Justice Rothstein, you have absolutely mastered in your entire career. Justice Rothstein, thank you so much for coming on to the show on behalf of the Law School Show. Everyone at, at, at this podcast, thank you so much. It truly has been a privilege and an honor to have had you on the show. And with all the advice and your life story, your career story, and your pathways, I'm very sure our audience is very very happy to have had you on, uh, to have had hurt your story being told to today uh, on the Law School Show. So once again, thank you so much, Justice Rothstein, for coming on to the show. Thank you for inviting me. And thank you to our audience for tuning in to this episode of the Law School Show. This was Justice Marshall Rothstein, former Justice of the Supreme Court of Canada, Wow, a very, very interesting story. And I'm, I hope that you have truly enjoyed this episode. Tune in next time as we have another interesting guest on the Law School Show. As for sure, over the past 200 plus episodes, we've, had, we've been giving you so many great guests and episodes. I hope that you will continue to tune in and to support us as well into the future. Until next time, signing off for now, this is Amos Vang. Stay safe and stay healthy. Hi, Amos Vang here, just coming off of Justice Rothstein's interview. That was really an interesting conversation, and it really struck me and impressed me so, so well, in, in the sense that Justice Rothstein went through life and had a very interesting and very slightly difficult beginning as well, working long, long hours on the dining car and being around many different types of people, including those you know, who didn't necessarily have the best opinion of him at the time. And the way how he was able to work through these kinds of different conflicts and different personalities and even keep in touch with them during those early years and decades after, that is something that I think we can all learn from. We can have many differences in our own personal interactions, but the way how we choose to resolve these differences and to associate with these differences is an important skill that I think we all need to have. And well, for many of us, we all need to relearn in our own daily lives. And I certainly enjoyed my time talking with Justice Rothstein, and I hope you guys did as, as well. If you enjoyed the video, click the like button. If you want to see more, subscribe and click the bell notification icon so you'll be notified whenever we upload. You can also follow us on thelawschoolshow.com and you can follow us on our social media. Thank you so much for watching, and we'll see you in the next video.